Hello everyone and welcome to a debut live APAC on this lovely Thursday afternoon. Uh, we are joined for part two of your series uh, with Yori and our party and um, before we start hello. I'd like to... Hello, hello! Um, before we start I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live, create and learn on today, paying respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and of course a bit of change of scenery today and a change of host as well. Um, so my name's Jo and I'm, I'm taking over the, the stream hosting um, responsibilities for today. But Yori, today is all about you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, happy to be back here. Wonderful. Um, as always, if you're watching on YouTube, join over on behance.net slash live to be a part of the live chat. Um, lovely seeing all the familiar faces here in chat as well. We've got Steve, we have Anna Davis Court, um, and we have, let's see, Brenda and our party as well, Amelia. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. Um, but without further ado, should we get started back into Photoshop? Mm hmm. Alrighty. Take it um, away, Flynn. <laughs> yeah, so I guess like going back to like the previous stream, I mostly talked about kind of like the basics of character design. I talked about shape, um, line of action, weight, expression, things like that. And today I'm going to be getting into like actually doing the illustration and like line quality as well as coloring. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just go back into it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, feel free to like shoot me any questions as I go along. Um, I'll be I'll be explaining what I'm doing um, as well. But yeah, feel free to just like shoot me any questions if you have them. Amazing. You read my mind. Um, the next thing that I was <laughs> going to say is uh, for those of you in the chat, uh, the pants chat, if you have any questions, especially now when it comes to line work or just any questions, big or small for Yori, throw them in the chat and Flynn and I will get to them um, as we can. But to recap, we are working on this lovely uh, grandma and, and child. Um, or children, actually, there's two of them. Um, illustration today with Yori. So in the previous stream, we talked about, you know, shape language um, and how to build up characters and how some shapes had a different kind of connotation, um, whether it was like a villain shape or a good guy shape. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, some really, really interesting stuff. So if you have any questions at the moment about line work, um, or, or creating these sketches, feel free to <laughs> to throw them in. I'm just seeing uh, Flynn commenting, angry triangle people, um, which is yes, very accurate. Yes, correct. Very accurate indeed. Um, I guess just like touching on like the brush, what I, like the brush that I'm using currently, um, again, because usually a lot of people ask me, it's just a cowl brush, it's a pencil, um, and my settings are, I usually just have shape dynamics turned on, and have the minimum diameter turned down just so you get like a nice taper to the line like that. Um, I also have smoothing on. Yeah, just like, you know, at like 12% on like something like that. Not too much, just so I can get like a nice smooth line like easily. Um, yeah. Amazing. And I also like this, to rotate. Uh... Oh no. Yep, yep go, go on. Ahead. Oh no, I was just saying I was like, gonna... I like to rotate my frame as well. Yeah, like when I'm like, when I'm trying to do like a straight line, I always try to rotate my frame just because I'm like comfortable in doing like, you know, like kind of like that angle of line. Um, yeah, so I constantly rotate my frame just to get like that perfect line as I go. Yep, so. Amazing, like emulating drawing in a piece of paper, you would always turn around the piece of paper to yeah. draw the lines the way that's most comfortable. That's. Uh... Mm -hmm. It's a, a not unique. It's an excellent thing to to carry on from traditional into the into the digital. Now, seeing here, I know that the question is going to come up because as a, a former and still current chat mod, uh, the question of what brushes are you using um, does come up <laughs> quite often. Is this was this brush edited from like the standard Photoshop brushes? What is was it edited from? 
uh, Carlty Webster's brushes, or do you know where um, the origins of this brush came from? <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure, I'm like 80% sure that this is the Kyle, the Kyle Webster brushes. Um, but I've modified them just like a bite a little bit, just because, yeah, it just depends on like what tablet I'm using as well as, you know, what, you, what if I'm doing more details, then I'll just have to adjust it as I go. Um, yeah, we talked about, we talked a little bit about brushes as well, um, from the other stream, just like how, you know, like, I feel like there's a misconception of like, if you use a certain brush, then your work is gonna look a certain way like it's gonna look like this artist is trying to emulate but that's just not the case like i think every artist um just they just have to find you know a set of brushes that they're comfortable with using Absolutely. and just kind of stick As with a, that yeah yeah i have to confess when i was a younger illustrator um i did have this idea well if i only have that one brush yeah. that my favorite yeah. artist has, then I will be able to create masterpieces. And to an extent, yes, you, you would get a similar effect, whether that's a textured brush or not. But at the end of the day, um, I think it would be much, much healthier to encourage artists to just discover what they enjoy drawing and whether that's this specific brush allows me to do things a certain way, that's great. But, you know, at the end of the day, the most important artist that you can be is is you so brushes yeah. on just focus on that <laughs> goodness me we went into full-on cheese town in like 10 minutes of the stream <laughs> love it um we have a question here from flynn which is a very good question nice technique do you only rotate the page for straight lines um i think i rotate the page for mostly anything like if i just like whatever I feel like is the most comfortable for me to draw, um, I'll just rotate it. Like I have my trackpad just like next to me and my Wacom is also like, is able to rotate. So that helps a lot. Like I just constantly go between those two and just find like the right angle for me to draw. I mentioned in the other stream as well that having, you know, a, a tablet like a Cintiq where you can draw directly on screen really helps a lot, especially if you're doing line work. Um, which I didn't have growing up, like I was using the intos where you just draw on the tablet and then you have to look at the screen, like you draw here and the screen's there. And it's very hard to get like an accurate line. Um, so having, you know, like a Cintiq or even an iPad and there's like a lot of other like cheaper tablet options out there as well nowadays. Um, yeah, it does really help. That's fantastic. That actually brings me up on a on a throwback question for, for last stream that unfortunately we did not get to. How old is your Cintiq that you're using? Um, so I got the Cintiq when I was in um, when I was in uni because I needed it for yeah, for like animating and so it's like maybe like around like I don't know, seven years maybe. It's quite old, but it still it still works great, so this is, uh, it's reminded me, I don't know if you've seen the meme, but it's a, uh, I think it, um, it's a vending machine and the lights turned off and someone has posted a, a paper sign on it, like the lights turned off, but I still work. Um, and I always, <laughs> I feel so much for the vending machine. Um, but oh. also, you know, like just because the machine or the equipment that you're using isn't born yesterday, so to speak, um, it doesn't mean you can't create amazing amazing work with it as well so actually yeah, really like cool. yeah it's 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 funny you mentioned that like i don't i feel like you know there are like newer cintiq models out now but i've yeah i don't actually want to change to those ones because i think they've changed like the the finishing on the glass so it feels a lot more like paper but like for me it just kind of feels unnatural like maybe because i'm just used to like the glass you know like the smooth glass that i have now um and it just kind of feels weird and I don't really want to change. Like, I'm, I'm a bit scared. Like if one day I have to replace my Cintiq, like, oh, am I going to like it? Um, because the texture is different. Because I think with like my Cintiq now, um, yeah, it's, with my Cintiq now, you can change the like the feel, like the texture of it by changing the like the tip of the pen. Um, they have like options where it's meant to like, yeah, they have options where it feels like a bit more like papery. And then there's another one that's like feels a bit bouncy. 
Um, like I'm currently using like just like the normal tip, but you have that option if you wanted it. Um, not sure about the newer ones though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the and this is actually a fun fact, something that I didn't realize so much later on. The the pen holder that comes with the Cintiq, if you screw it open, you do get those pen nips inside. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. day that I discovered this was a very good day. Um, but it's, yeah. it's curious because most people would would say that, oh, I want my my tablet or drawing surface to emulate paper more. But you're the, you're yeah. the exact opposite. I, I really don't like even like um, you know like those gloves that they use to so that your hand kind of like rests on the yeah I, I don't like those very much either um, I think I've just gotten used to just drawing the way I have so far just like you know just with nothing on my with no glove and with the very smooth texture of the, <laughs> the glass it's funny how you just get used to things very quickly um, and even like now, like if I'm like switching back to my older Cintiq, which is like my third in HD, like it just doesn't feel right. Um, that's the one that I have at home and like I just can't work very well at home just because I'm not used to the, the feel of the Cintiq. Um, yeah. I think it's it's easy for, for creators, you know, like blame it on the tools, like, oh, well, this pen isn't calibrated or uh, or if it, just in general, like it's, it's um, it's not the tools that are wrong, it's the, the person holding the tools, but it's interesting yeah. how if the tool isn't right, for some like in some scenarios, it could completely throw you off. Like even if you compare working on a on a Cintiq to working on an Intuos, that's still like you, you have to coordinate and I know I'm doing the robot um at the moment but you have to coordinate with your eyes either looking on a screen and using your hands or that it can all be in in the one place so yeah it's it's curious how some people would argue I that think... having a very glossy screen is like the primitive tool or air quotes primitive. <laughs> um but for you it's it's the perfect thing yeah i think like i feel like if i if i do need to change one day like i'll probably get used to it eventually but like if it's not necessary like for me to do an upgrade like uh, yeah why why should i like because i'm happy with what i'm using now so absolutely if it's not broken don't need to fix it <laughs> just checking in on chat again we've we've got some lovely cheese puns after the the cheese town <laughs> mention um so we have Mmm, Cheese Town sounds like a tasty place. For those that don't know, in Australia we have Tasty Cheese. Don't know if that was an intentional pun or not, but then Anna swinging in with a Gouda place to visit. I agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving that my first stream is like very food based. This is, this is fantastic. Um, and then just checking in on the rest of the chat. Um, Mm, I don't know if the the, rel the Rosellas know that I'm that I'm the host today, but hopefully they'll they'll keep their distance and we can chill out after the stream, uh, so we don't have the bird calls calls with us today. Um, throwing in just the last time before we we might move forward is if anyone has any more questions regarding line work, whether it's um, brush related or just making lines. Um, if we have any more questions for that in the chat, please let um, me know. Otherwise, we might. I guess like talking forward. about yeah, talking about lines again. Like what I tend to do is that I I mean I have like pressure sensitivity on so that you can see there's a bit of like a weight, you know, there's like a thickness and there's like a thin one and it just kind of helps with selling the weight of the character. But um, it also helps to kind of like go back in and just kind of like thicken certain lines just so you get kind of like a sense of like a shadow. Like I'm still going to do that in the coloring stage, but I think just having a little bit of weight, you know, like in parts where you think the shadow would cost is a helpful way to kind of like help sell kind of the, you know, the weight and the volume of the character. So and that's something that's that, that I usually yeah that's usually something i would do like at the end like after i finish like all the lines and i just look at it from far away and like see like which parts you know i can yeah i can add in sorry you were saying 
Um, no, no, that's that's perfectly fine. This is this is your show primarily. Um, but just it made me think of for one, it's really important to zoom out and flip your 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 illustration or photo as you're making it to see that everything is in is in balance. But that's getting yes, that's getting a little bit technical. But I'm also wondering no, if yeah, you yeah. having thicker lines now in in the line work is also an indication of how strong the shadows should be when you pop on some color on the piece. Yeah, yeah. It does help as well. I think just having a little bit of black like in between the colors just I think just help you know not have it look so flat. Um yeah, what you mentioned about flipping the the frame is something that I do as well. Actually, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um I think that's a lot that's like a trick that a lot of artists use as well just to check that everything looks all right. Um But yeah, Dare I ask if it's if it's time to flip the the frame already? What do we think? Oh, that's like a scary. That's like a scary part because I usually I know, you'll see I'm all sorry. the flaws, and then I'm like, shit. Like I need to, I need to like fix everything. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess we can maybe do it just we should. For a second, just for the sake of the stream, we do it just for a second, then we can switch back. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is this is terrifying. You can do it. I'm here for you. There you go. See, that's great. <laughs> that's great. We I mean, she looks, she looks, she looks all right. <laughs> the shape. And wow. then we'll just. Chef's kiss. We'll just. Wonderful. We'll just flip back. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, that's, that's great. But let, let's go back to the comfort zone, please. <laughs> let's go back. Let's go back to this one. <laughs> Absolutely, but um, again, for for those in the chat, flipping the the canvas, whether it's uh, horizontal, yes, or vertical, depending on what you need, is really useful to see that either your shape of the character or just the piece that you're working on, like it all feels balanced. So best case scenario is that no matter how you flip the the frame or the canvas, the the composition and what you're trying to achieve still looks sort of cohesive and balanced and this is it's a little bit of um, a scary thing for us illustrators to do because usually it'll bring to light all these imbalances and potential imperfections that we just don't see like expose you your secrets the screen exactly yeah. um so no, but that is a really also, good point to make it is I mean, it's it's a thing of um Oh, I can't find the words right now, but just just really the more you do it, the less scary it gets and realizing that, oh, yes, I will actually, you know, learn something from this and it, it will be good for me as, as scary as it is. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Just, that, that was not a prompted that. scene. Yes, saving is excellent. Um, no, I just saw was... like that, um, the wheel of doom and I, I needed to like save just because before it crashes or something. Absolutely. Say your work, guys. It's very important. Um, and um, so should I? As well. Should I? Um, do you want me to move forward with like colors? Because I'll just be doing the same thing with like the two kids. Um, yeah. And maybe if you want, I like we can time. move on to colors, and I can talk a little bit more about that, just so we don't run out of time. Absolutely. Um, Let's yeah. So this in. yeah, I guess. There you go. It's uh, it's a cooking show. I've I've got the finished one prepared. Hey, amazing. <laughs> um, Boom. Yeah. There it's done. Um, yeah. So I've done all the characters in different layers just so I can yeah color them a lot easier. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you I guess like two different coloring methods that I use usually use. Um, so this first one is more, one that I'm more comfortable with usually. Um, so whenever I'm coloring, I usually start off with a like kind of like a quick block out of the character, and I would just use this, this uh, magic wand tool, make a selection, and then select, and then inverse, just so it selects the shape of the character. And mm. as you can see here, there's like a little bit of like it selects like that, you know, you like two like maybe like two three pixels yeah. outside. Yeah, yeah, so what you do is go back to select and then you go modify and then contract by two pixels and then it'll just select, you know, right exactly inside the lines. Um, 
and that's just gonna make your base look a lot neater that is fantastic i don't know if it uh, well it was caught on stream because my camera's on but my jaw just dropped at realizing that this is even possible wow that's um that's a neat trick we we have a a question here from flynn that i that i think is a is a great one um and everyone else please feel free to to throw in your questions as well but um the question was do you ever deviate from your original sketch during line work um and i think this can be um, for for coloring as well do you realize as you're throwing in colors like maybe the silhouette isn't working as much anymore or is sort of the line work like no that's that's set in stone to either save time or just to to move forward that um, um yeah no i i definitely change like i change my mind a lot whenever i'm doing like stuff for myself or doing stuff even for like clients like that's kind of the point of iterating um and whenever yeah like whenever i do a sketch it's not set in stone like i guess just for this you know for this demo like i've got the idea down already and i know what i'm supposed to be doing just for the sake of you know like time because i'll just be fumbling around changing things if i have the time and yeah the opportunity to change stuff it's a, it's a it's a tricky trap when you're not on stream, but um, it, it's you know happy to to have you on stream. I had a lunch <laughs> and I lost it, but um, this actually because I was reminded of something that we spoke about just before before we went live of knowing like during the sketch phase and obviously now we're into the the color the color stage, but where there's a lot going on in your mind while you're working maybe some some of it is sort of very very conscious and some of it can be completely subconscious but knowing that the scribbles that you put on onto the page mean something to you um but then because you're doing all this work up in your head a scribble might actually i'm gonna reset that sentence because that made no sense um but essentially just knowing that the what's on the page and what what is in your mind is different and that to move on to the next stage whether that's color or shading or, or whichever you don't have to have a polished sketch on the paper um because it's really about yeah. knowing that okay this is my plan it's all set now i can move forward we got there in the end guys thank you for for bearing with me <laughs> So in terms of picking colors now for for this this stage, obviously this is a stream, so you might have had some pre-prepared. But do you have any go-to color combinations or like a base color treatment, and then you kind of mix and change after, or is it really just a um, um, new set of colors for each each illustration? So um, I guess like in terms of picking colors, like I I usually just go by feel and see whatever I think looks the best. I also like to go back to my references and then see if I can pick out any colors from that particular image that I like. Um, another way to do it is to just go to like these websites that are like color palette generators. If you're really, really stuck, you can go to those and yes, you can find like a palette like very quickly and like play around with that. Um, yeah, I guess like another thing is also, this is why like I was just about to explain why I've like separated out all the colors as like, you know, like the skin, the hair, the clothes. The reasoning behind that is that so I can change my mind at any point and it's not going to take me forever to recolor um, everything just because they're on the same layer. So having it on separate layers would really help you in revising if you're working, you know, for a client or something and they want like revisions for colors or even just more options and things like that. And so having it be on separate layers does really help, you know, for you to decide colors as well as to revise um yeah again i'm just explaining like what brush i'm using for this because um, it's a different brush and the reasoning behind that is because the brush that i use for the line work is a lot more textured um and as you can see like when i was picking when i was like selecting the outer um area of the image it creates like this feathering effect and it doesn't like it's a lot different it's like more difficult for me to color in with a paint bucket and so I've chosen a brush that's got less texture like that one it's got it's got less texture compared to the one that I use for the lines which is mm. I think it was like I think it was like this one 
as you can see, it's like the different than like the difference in like the texture. I mean, the textured one looks great for, you know, for, uh, for the lines, but I guess not so much if you're trying to block out colors. And so that's when I pick out a different brush and yeah, it's a lot easier. I'll just like create an outline and just use the paint bucket tool to fill in the, the shape. And it's just a lot faster process for me. Absolutely. And, and would, in, in terms of being able to change colors quickly, how would you go about that? Would it be a, a clipping mask or, a, or something um, that you would have on top? I guess I would go like I would just go with like hue saturation and just change it or like color balance and I'll just like I'll, I'll probably show you in a little bit after I've done like the base colors for these and I'll show you um, like I guess like how I adjust my colors and you know I guess like the benefits of separating out your layers uh, are we good for time like how much time do we have left uh, we are about the halfway mark on my okay. on my calculation i'm gonna thankfully i can leave all the the time warnings to our chat mod flynn uh so flynn if you wouldn't mind just letting me know how we're going on on time that would be great uh but speaking of time i'm seeing that you're outlining outlining rather the area of of canvas that you want to color in and then using the the fill tool is that something you use um, off stream just to save time or is, is um, that specific yeah. for us today yeah that's um, no no that's that's what I that's what I usually do as well like I would just I mean if it's like for a smaller area then I would just like color in as if I'm coloring in like a coloring book with pencils um, but if it's like a bigger area then I would just like kind of do this like block out the color real quick and then use the bucket the paint bucket tool to fill in the colors Fantastic. Um, another excellent tip um, for those illustrators and creators joining us here today. I'm going to have a peruse of the chat, see if we've got any questions. Um, sure. And stop bugging you for a while so you can, so you can uh, get <laughs> no. the, the coloring. I'm sorry if I'm a, I'm a bit quiet just because like, I guess I did all the talking in the first stream and yeah, like just, I don't, I can't talk very much when I'm like actually drawing, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll try. I'll try my best to answer questions you're as I doing, go as well. You're doing an excellent job. Um, it's, it's a tricky situation that we put our creatives through here, getting them to not only create incredible pieces of work, which they do, they do just on their own, but also asking them to talk while doing it as well. So um, I'm going to check in with chat and and let you do your do your thing for a little bit. So checking in with chat, let's see. Excellent comment from from Brenda um, about line weight. I know we're referencing back a little bit, but um, that's a really good point on the line weight. It helps to determine the light and the shadow placement for the character, and it adds the depth. At, it adds depth to the illustration as well so that's that's a great point we have acknowledgement of the wheel of doom um, which i think is <laughs> the enemy of all all creatives um i saw just now that you tried to to fill it in and it, it filled in way too much that you had intended and yeah that's things. there you go it that's brings what us to, to a question we we had before um, so if you have breaks in your line work, does that selection method work or do you need to make no, sure? you have to make sure that you're close. Yeah, you have to complete your lines. That's why I was like, I need, I needed to turn off the lines for a second to see if I have breaks in my, you know, in my block out. Um, Excellent. I was, I was waiting to find a way to, to answer that question and then it presented itself so that that's excellent. Um, how do you thick and thin lines digitally? Uh, from Steven. So this is all in the shape dynamics of the brush. So just like how you would have a, a monoline brush where it's just the same uh, thickness all the way through. If you adjust the shape dynamics in your brush settings and also the amount of pressure that you put on the brush on the on the paper, on the, the tablet, it will then change from very thin when you have very little pressure 
um, and then to quite thick when you have a lot of pressure. And, and then in the shake dynamics and in your settings, you can adjust how, how dramatic that difference is between light pressure and uh, more pressure. So that's, that's yeah, I guess that's, 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 that's what I was showing at the beginning, like having the minimum diameter be very like tiny, just, just so it creates more of like a, let me just like create like a new layer for that real quickly. Like, yeah, like you can go like very dramatic, like so. And if you increase the diameter, like it won't create as much of like a difference. Like it's, it'll still create somewhat of like a difference, but it's not, yeah. And I much prefer doing everything in like one stroke. And so having like, you know, that change be more dramatic, be a bit more dramatic helps, um, helps me in working like faster when I'm doing lines, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you, you get the expression quicker and you don't have to yeah. redraw the line as many times to get that, um, the thickness differentiation. Speaking of uh, color again, from a Wayne Marshall, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, does Yori ever work in grayscale, then convert to color after? I think that's that's a great trick yeah. for, for figuring out your values. Yeah, that's um, that's something that I usually do when I'm doing paintings. So uh, yeah, it's not so much something that I would do with like characters, but what I'm doing when I'm doing paintings, I tend to go with grayscale first, and then go in with like um. A color layer like you can what you can do in photoshop is that you can change the blending modes here and change it to color and then you can just pretty much add in color with that and then yeah just like adjust on top um but that's not something that i would normally do um that's something that i would do for like the thumbnail phase so if i'm just like trying to wrap out something very quickly then i'll do that and use it just to kind of like wrap out the colors after i got my values down down but like if i'm doing like an actual illustration you get like richer colors by just actually putting in the colors right away compared to doing it grayscale and then putting the colors on top. That's main, for me mainly, that's just a way for me to think about colors and value separately, but not so much as my process um, when I'm doing like a final piece, just because it kind of dulls the color a little bit. Um, yeah. Excellent. It, it was really interesting how you, how you compared, like if you start with grayscale, um, you generally would get potentially more muted colors than just throwing throwing the colors onto the canvas. Um, I have to also give a, a shout out to Adrienne Volujo, who is with us today in chat. Thank you for, for stopping by and, and welcome to the stream. And of course, it's, uh, it's lovely to have you here. Now with time, I was just checking in with Flynn and we have, well now we are below the half an hour mark but um, oh no how are okay. we how are we thinking do, do we want to block colors in for a little bit longer or is it time to um take advantage of the the cooking show gimmick and maybe show it's probably time to take further yeah further down the yeah line. it's probably <laughs> that's probably what i would do um i guess like i'm, I'm kind of done with blocking out colors for the grandma anyways i'm not going to do the kids just because they're going to be the same thing um but i guess like going into i guess like with this style of coloring it's uh it's called uh, cell shading and i'm just gonna go in and um add in the shadow layer what i used to do is like when i just started up with photoshop is i would pick out a color that's like darker than the base color and then use it to color that way but then it takes a long time to pick out every individual colors like if you go to like colors and change this to lab sliders it's going to give you a slider where it just goes from like dark to light i know you can see if you can see like what i'm doing but like pretty much that's like a darker color of that but it's not yeah, it's not very, it's, it's kind of time consuming. And so what I would do now is I would just create a new layer, um, clip it on top, um, and I'll just pick out a shadow color that's kind of like, I don't know, let's just say it's like this color and then fill that and then set it to multiply and erase parts where I think the light would um, hit the character. It's, it's yep. it, for me so, personally, it's so surreal because I've always seen this trick done, but never knew exactly how it was done. So, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm very excited. And I, and I think everyone in chat is 
excited as well about learning all these um, fantastic tricks. So that just makes coloring a lot more easier and just creates more of like a cohesive shadow color compared to if you just pick out individual colors for each of the, you know, of the layers. So if I just do that, like it'll just, yeah, it just makes it a lot easier for me. And I can just think about, you know, how the light is hitting the characters instead of, you know, having to worry about all the individual colors it just makes me work a lot faster that way as well. So. So now I'm just thinking about, okay, well, how is the light going to hit the character? Like if it's coming from like the top right. Um, and again, if I want to change things, I'll just go back and like fill in those areas with that same color um, to edit the shape of like, this makes it a lot easier. Yeah, that's, that's great. I've, I've seen some people um, do this thing where they'll draw out the, the light source. So do you feel like knowing that, okay, the light is coming from the top right, I have it in my mind, I don't need to essentially like sketch it out on the page. Is, is that something that you would take advantage of as well? Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess I don't really do that when I'm like actually, yes, have it in my head. Like I kind of know, okay, well, I want the light source to be from the top right. Um, and kind of just go. Excellent. I think we had a little bit of a of a, a cutout there, but um, hopefully everyone in the chat heard heard what you were saying. Actually, to to bring back sort of way way back on a big scope for for just drawing an, an illustration, um, we have a great question from Stephen, and, and feel free to to marinate on this one a little bit as well. Um, but how do you forge your own unique artistic style? Uh, are there any tips, tutorials, um, or steps? Yeah, that's a big topic that I, you know, talk about with like other artists and just, you know, something that I oftentimes think about is like, okay, style is like something that's really important, I guess, in the art world because it really makes you distinctive compared to like other people. Um, but I guess it depends on like what kind of work you're aiming to do. For me, like if you're doing, I guess if you're doing like in-house work in a studio, for me, it's better to have a more diverse style just because sometimes they want you to work on, you know, multiple shows and you, you're constantly changing styles as you go. And so being more um, flexible is actually an advantage just because so you're not so married on, you know, like just one particular style. Um, but having your own style that's specific is also helpful if you are looking for like freelance work just because people look at your work on you know like on social media or on your website or on what you know whatever platform you're on and they want you, you to work on their stuff because of your style in particular so that's like two very different things i think having a bit of both is great um having a distinct style that you're comfortable with doing is great but also having a little bit of flexibility is also great so in terms of like forging your own style i guess like for me um, took me a while to get to a place where I'm like, okay, well, this is something that I'm happy with. Um, it just took a lot of like looking at other people's work and seeing and picking out things that I like about their work and trying to instill that in my own. Um, and it took a long time to get, to get, to get that, I guess. I wouldn't say that I'm like, you know, I, I don't think I'm like the most consistent person, like in terms of style, like I tend to change styles a lot. And even like today, I'm showing you guys like two different ways to approach like the same, you know, like the same character. Like I'm going to do show like two different coloring methods. Um, and that's just kind of like how I like to go about, you know, illustrating. Um, I don't like just like sticking to one style in particular just because I get bored very easily. And so I like to like, you know, experiment and change. Um, yeah, and just like try different things. I guess that's what they encouraged us in uni as well is like to just be more flexible and you know, not be afraid of trying different styles because, you know, you never know what you're going to like down the road. Like if you, yeah, if you try different things, um, I guess I'm like going back to like what I'm doing now. Like I've just, let's just say like, okay, well, this is like a finished kind of like block out of the shadow. Um, another thing that I like to do is I like to darken certain areas. So if I just pick out, you know, like a big fluffy, you know, like a, a soft brush and let me just go back and pick out that shadow color. Let's go back to multiply and darken it a little bit. It, it just kind of, it's just kind of nice to add a little bit of depth 
just because like this coloring style is very simple and so just having that kind of like a little bit of like a different shade kind of helps to add depth um another thing you can do it's like a similar thing it's just to go to like this tool which is the burn tool and then set it to midtones and you can pretty much do the same thing um, but if you want to kind of have more control over the color just and then just use the brush um you can even change you know change it to like a different color and i don't know let's just let's just try something yeah like you can kind of have like that definitely is looking like a villain character for sure yeah and then going back and like going back to what i mentioned earlier it's just like changing like if i'm if i'm not happy with the color i can just go back and change the you know the colors in hue saturation just because yeah it's just a lot easier yeah something like that that's that's fantastic so i think long long story short um steven um just create things and 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 i think don't be don't be afraid to to try new things to of course learn from people you are inspired by whether that's doing uh studies so, of their work um but yes back to the stream we have i'm going to show you guys yeah i'm going to show you guys like a finish again because we've got 10 minutes left so that's like a finish you know color that i've decided on um, something that I like to do when I'm like finishing like uh, a piece is like I, I like to add in texture because like this is looking really flat like I've used textured brushes but this is looking very flat and um, a trick that I do to soften my lines a little bit is that I use chromatic aberration like effects and like noise effects in my images so I'll just merge that image and then I'll go to filter and then lens correction and then I'll just change those settings. I mean, chromatic aberration is, I think it's like a photography term. Um, it's just, it's kind of like imperfections in where, in which where like the, when a light hits the lens, it doesn't all hit the same point in like the, the object. And so it creates, it creates kind of like a fringe of color. It's kind of like the best way to explain it is like, um, those old like 3D effects like glasses where you see like the red and the blue on like, you know, on the sides of the image and then you see it flipped on the glasses. That, so that's kind of what it is. And it creates like that effect. It creates like a bit of a color on the lines in a very quick and easy way. Um, you can do the same thing manually, but like I like I'm just trying to save time here. So that's how I would do it. Like I would just use that effect and then it'll look like it makes the illustration looks a bit softer. Um, and another thing is I would go in and add in like a noise texture or something. So again, like pick out like a color and you clip it to the image and then you go to filter and then noise, add noise, something like that. And then you go in and kind of like pick out an effect that you think looks good. Again, this takes a lot of like trial and error just because like every like every image is different and you don't know which one is going to look the best but yeah just like having like a little bit of color like ha sorry texture um kind of helps um in making the image look a bit softer so yeah so that's like so that's the finished image right there so that's that's one coloring method i want to show you another one that's a very quick and easy one um it's just a lot faster way to color uh, but still kind of make it look fun and appealing and it, it looks a bit less like digitally <laughs> if that, yeah so it, I'm trying to aim and make it look a bit more traditional so with this one I guess I would try to pick out like a brush that's like so how much time do we have left um, a flame was just letting me know that we have actually more time than I thought we did. Um, but now okay. you're officially more more towards the ten minute mark. But me knowing All right. the so I'm just going to like make it very very quick. I'm just gonna show you very quickly. So that's that's the other coloring one like method that I'm going to show you. I guess I'm just gonna show you like the finished one and show you how I achieve this effect very quickly. It's very simple. Basically, you just pick out a brush that's like. Kind of like a rougher brush and then you go to like your brush settings and make sure to turn on color dynamics and that's pretty much it and you just like color in like you would 
um, with pencils. Um, yeah, because like what, what it does with color dynamics is that it changes the color every time you make a stroke. And so it creates like that kind of effect, like when you're coloring in very quickly, like, um, let me just show you. That is a like, very nifty trick. Yeah, that's a very that's like a that, that's like a trick that I often do when I'm trying to finish something very quickly, but I want it to look like, kind of like interesting. Um, but yeah, I can basically just color in, and then it'll change the color every time I make a stroke. So, kind of creates like this colored pencil effect. Um, yeah, it's like it's the the color of like the, of the multicolored pencils, but. It's a really fun yeah. technique. But digital. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what I do. And I, I guess like with the with the shadows and everything, it's pretty much it's the same it's the same principle. Just like picking out a color that's like, you know, whatever color, like shadow color you want and putting on multiply, erasing parts where yeah. So that's my shadow layer. And that's kind of that's kind of what it looks like without that. Mm. That yeah fantastic and it, it, it's great to see that you can achieve i mean really completely different final pieces from just as equally easy easy techniques that is that's fantastic and i i personally i've so... learned a lot in those <laughs> last five minutes that's that's great um to i mean we we have gone through a lot today um, and I know we were speaking just before about, yes, with, with colour and light and everything, that should really just be its own series, almost, uh, because there is a lot, a lot to cover. Um, but I think if you want to pan out a little bit, as, as we are nearing the end of the stream, we have a wonderful question from, from Brenda, uh, which is, can you tell us a little bit about the story behind the characters, like their interaction? To each other oh yeah that's that's something that i wanted to mention like i guess i talked more about character interactions in the first stream where i mostly emphasize on knowing what your character's personalities are and that's kind of like the main thing when you're a character illustrator is that you have to know like you know what what the characters likes what you know and dislikes and things like that because that's going to help inform you um inform your d design decisions and i guess like with with this one because it's like it's more of like a character illustration instead of like a proper character turnaround for animation or like a character sheet um so you know you kind of want to show a two-in-one you want to show the design as well as their personality so like i get i guess what like with these characters they're meant to be like it's like a you know like a grandma nanny character with like these two children like spoiled kids who are fighting over like this little chihuahua that's kind of like the story behind it it's like a very simple prompt um but you want to be able to translate that in the body language and like the posing of the character you want to have them you know uh contrast the the grandma like because the grandma looks very stern she looks very like her stance is like a perfect vertical while the kids have more of like a you know, like you can see like the curved line um, in the line of action as I was like talking about in the last in the last stream, like you kind of see like that, you know, like that curve, that curved line, like with the grandma is like a straight up and down. So these are all intentional choices to help sell kind of like the story behind those characters. Um, and it's yeah, that's like the that's like the best part about character design is like trying to tell a story with, you know, like your, your drawings, like your, your illustrations and yeah, try to convey like all three characters. Like you see, like the kids are fighting and the grandma's just like had enough. Like she's just with everybody and like she's kind of like angry. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of like what I was trying to achieve with this in terms of like the characters. And I, I think I speak on, on behalf of everyone in the stream and in the chat as well. You absolutely have achieved it. You knocked it out of the park. And this Thank has you. been such a fantastic uh fantastic two two part series and and speaking of it being a series everyone i would encourage you if you haven't seen it already to see part one uh, of this as well where we kind of talk a little bit or a lot a bit more about the the theory and just some practical fundamental tips of how you develop develop your characters we are um, sadly, time does go by uh, more quickly when you're having fun. We are at the five minute mark, so I want to 
make a call out to the chat if you have any last minute questions for for Yori, please feel free to to throw them in um otherwise i might put us up on well flynn might put us up on the big screen and we can just have a little bit of a chat before we before we close things out so while we wait for for questions to come in um actually no we do have a question from steve um, Yori, Ugh. have you ever tried separating images into layers to, to animate? I know you, you studied both 2D and 3D animation. Has animation come into your, to your um, I guess, creative practice uh, nowadays? Um, I guess like in terms of like separating out layers for animation is more for like, I guess if you're animating in After Effects, then you would have to separate out the I guess like the arms, the legs, the head, like whatever you want to rig, you have to separate them out. But like, yeah, I don't really do that as much anymore. Like I did a little bit of After Effects in uni, just like, you know, to to learn, but not as like a working thing. Like I don't work in like animation now, like I'm working in more like, you know, concept art and illustration, but it's still good to know. Cause like if, um, yeah, say if like somebody needs to, needs you to make assets for, uh, yeah, for like a Toon Boom animation or like for like an After Effects animation, then knowing what to separate it out is really important as well. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. Yeah, it's a fantastic answer to the question. Uh, we are now at the three minute mark almost. Um, before we go, where can everyone check out more of your work um, after this stream? Or do you have anything else that you'd like to, to plug while we have you here with us? Um, I guess it's just my Instagram, just my, I think it's like on screen right now. My, my Instagram handle is just Yuri Narpati. I mostly post like your yeah, personal stuff on there. Just like fan art sometimes as well for studies, things like that. Um, yeah. So if you'd like to have a look, hop on my Instagram. Fantastic. And I have to do my due diligence as well. You did recently illustrate uh, a children's book. Uh, the link to that will hopefully be passed into the chat by Flynn um, but I wanted to say a massive thank you once again for, for thank joining you. us for this two part series thank you so much for personally, having me personally I hope you'll come back soon again um, <laughs> I hope so, so as well so <laughs> thank you, thank you Joanna, thank you and again to just say with the, the little captain and I'm sorry Flynn you thought I was going to end it and I did not um, but I will in just a moment <laughs> The, the children's book that um, that we were talking it about is Little Captain by uh, Lindley Joyner. Um, and yep. it's a Kickstarter and it was fully funded and it's super exciting. And congratulations on that as well. But now, mm -hmm. I think, Flynn, it's, it's time to say goodbye for today. So thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you. Have a lovely day. See you. Thank you. Bye.